Great. It's, um, it's been a fascinating a uh, discussion to be on the regulatory end of its um, terrific, uh, terrific morning. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great um, pleasure to be here. Um, great to be back amongst uh, colleagues in Brussels, one of the world's most international cities, and the perfect venue for today's uh, discussion uh, on global communications. Brussels, of course, is also the beating heart of the European Union, so I'd forgive you for looking a bit quizzically at your program today when you saw that my chosen topic uh, was Brexit. But I can think of no better place to discuss what the UK's plan to leave the EU will mean for people and businesses who rely on communication services on both sides of the North Sea. Because the industries we regulate, and we've heard this morning, are global businesses bound invisibly, inextricably by fibre optics, satellite signals, radio waves, and the rules that govern them have been shaped by years of careful collaboration between regulators, governments, industry, European and international bodies. And today I want to explain why that collaboration can, and indeed in my view must, continue for the benefits of all our citizens. As the UK's exit from the EU is negotiate, uh, negotiated, I want to highlight the importance and the interdependence of our communication sectors. The Brexit process is underway. Uh, the UK will cease to be a member of the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. The government, the UK government's EU withdrawal bill currently in Parliament, is designed to carry over to UK law, when we exit, the same general rules and regulations that currently exist right across the UK, uh, the EU rather, today. Last month, um, colleagues may have seen that the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, called for an implementation period so that all EU countries can adjust to the new arrangements in a smooth and in an orderly way. She spoke of a new economic partnership underpinned by high standards and a practical, pragmatic approach to regulation. As the UK's media and telecoms regulator, we're politically neutral, we're independent of government, but also of the companies that we regulate. Ofcom takes no view either on the means or indeed the merits of Brexit and we fully support the government in its desire for continued effective regulation delivered through close collaboration with European partners. The UK has always played a positive role in that process. We are proud, active members of European groups, and it's great to see colleagues today, including the body of European regulators for electronic communications, the European regulators group for audiovisual media services, and the Radio Spectrum Policy Group, as well as regional and global bodies such as the European Conference for Postal and Telecommunications Administrations and the ITU. And of course, the IIC, our great host over these few days. Fittingly, this historic institute was founded at Ditchley Park in Oxfordshire in the UK. Later, a filming backdrop to an international broadcasting success Downton Abbey, which some of you may have seen uh, streamed across the airwaves. If you didn't see Downton, it is more than a country uh, house in the Victorian era. It is an outstanding example of a transatlantic media partnership between independent producers, US distributors, and Britain's ITV, which is one of Europe's biggest uh, broadcasters. Like many other productions, it symbolizes the truly international nature of our industries. The UK is also home to some of the world's largest pan-European media companies. The BBC alone generates hundreds of millions of uh, pounds of revenue from European markets. Sky provides satellite services beyond the UK in Italy, Germany, Austria, Ireland. Discovery, based in London, broadcasts right across the EU, and its audiences can trust what they watch 
because of Ofcom's broadcasting rules formed under our common European framework. Likewise, our biggest telecoms provider, BT, offers services to every EU country. The UK uh, mobile operator, O2, is owned by Spain's Telefonica, which also has operations in Germany, Vodafone Group, headquartered in London, but generates half its revenues, some £20 billion, providing services to EU citizens. These companies provide the networks by which, our, um, by which our companies trade and our people communicate. Our broadcasters share uh, TV formats, shows and perspectives that transcend borders and build that shared cultural experience. So how can these benefits endure or indeed be enhanced after Brexit? To help answer that question, we as a regulator have been speaking in depth to the companies that we regulate. It's true, some of them see potential opportunities. Many also tell us that they face challenges ahead. And I wanted to explain three particular burden, uh, three particular hurdles rather, that our businesses would like to see overcome before we approach Brexit. And probably the biggest issue, certainly the one facing our broadcasters, is about how they can continue to reach the whole EU from the UK and vice versa. The EU law enshrines a country of origin principle, allowing broadcasters to transmit across the entire EU, provided they comply with the rules of their host country. Ofcom, we license 1,200 TV services, but almost a third of those aren't broadcasting to UK viewers. But they must still comply with our rules. Impartial and accurate news, free speech, a right to privacy, and the protection of children. Conversely, around 35 channels transmit into the UK, but are not licensed in the UK. And the same is true of um, popular on-demand services like Netflix, very popular amongst uh, UK viewers, but licensed in the Netherlands. The country of origin principle benefits all citizens in the EU and supports all our broadcasters, providing a mass audience, promoting cultural exchange by transcending our borders. And we believe that that freedom of transmission and reception should endure between the UK and the EU after Brexit. But country of origin principle can't uh, remain merely by existing in UK law. It will only stand if the EU 27 continue to allow UK-based companies to broadcast to their countries under UK rules. And if the UK allows companies based overseas to broadcast here under EU rules. Now, when we've been talking to many of our broadcasters, they have stressed the importance of this issue. Some of them indeed are already having to consider the disruption of relocation. Others are committed to remaining in the EU, but worry about their ability to reach EU audiences unimpeded. Broadcasters have told us they're starting to make contingency plans to move their editorial fun functions to mainland Europe, plans that could be activated as early as this year. Others have said that they are having to put some of their plans for new investment in the UK on hold. All would like greater certainty, and I'm pleased that the UK's Culture Secretary, Karen Bradley, within the UK government is taking the lead on this. Second pressing concern relates to the cornerstone and the currency of modern communications, and that's, of course, data, which we've heard a lot about this morning. Today, digital information travels freely within the European economic area, thanks to shared standards of privacy and protection. But personal data can't leave the EEA unless the European Commission is sure it will be adequately protected by the receiving country. The EC has awarded this data adequacy kite mark, in a way, this status to 12 countries outside the EEA, from Andorra to Uruguay. 
And clearly, media and telecoms companies need the certainty that the UK, which already complies with EU data law, will retain this status. Without that assurance, pan-European operators will face practical and they will face commercial disruption. UK firms might have to negotiate separate data agreements with all their European partners, costing time and money. Those with multiple data centers across continental Europe may have to relocate all of them to the UK. Again, a significant operational undertaking. One of our uh, leading mobile operators told us that data movement is their number one strategic and commercial priority during Brexit. Indeed, many major broadcasters too rely on cross-border data in order to distribute their content. One broadcaster again said to us that they consider the data transfer issue even more salient, even more pressing a business than the country of origin principle. So I, I fully agree with our, the UK's digital minister, Matt Hancock, who wants to achieve an unhindered, secure flow of data after Brexit. It would mean a new deal between the UK and the European Union based on mutual respect and interest, but also based on common rules of protection. Ofcom is working very closely with our UK data agency, the Information Commissioner's Office, to identify some of the particular implications for our sector, but also to inform the government's negotiations. The third uh, big issue that's been raised by industry is access to skilled workers. Communications companies right across Europe have international workforces sharing employment and expertise from boardroom right down to the street cabinet. They need academics, specialist managers, engineers to complete urgent projects. And they rely on workers who are mobile to construct fiber and 5G networks, which is again, we've heard this morning, so necessary to our ecosystems. Our broadcasters too depend on highly skilled people, many from overseas. Estimates suggest that in the UK, about 40% of those working in the creative industries may be EU nationals without a UK citizenship. Their work is seen by audiences from Amsterdam, like the way to Zagreb. All employees, of course, need certainty. And the government has made the status of EU workers a priority in its negotiations. And we certainly hope that progress there will start to clarify for staff right across our industries and to the companies who rely on them. If our industries overcome these hurdles, they also face some broader headwinds. We recognize that the investment climate is uncertain there are some positive signs, I have to say, such as strong commercial demand for IT services, but some companies wishing to build networks are also unsure about consumer spending and the UK's future trading relationship with the EU. And in broadcasting domestically in the UK, advertising revenues have started to soften with a drop this year of about 5%. So when we call for the for UK communication uh, customers, in the UK to be given priority in Brexit negotiations. It is not only for the importance of the economy, some 57 billion pounds of revenues in the UK alone, <coughs> it's also because our communication firms face a mixture of uncertainties, and many of these can only be resolved through a successful Brexit process. Looking further ahead, to the question about regulation over Brexit, after Brexit. The question is how do companies, how should companies be regulated for the benefit of UK consumers? And I wanted briefly to set out a, a vision that Ofcom has for how UK regulation could continue to work smoothly and effectively after Brexit. For the UK, one big change will be the loss of the European Commission's role in overseeing our legal frameworks. For many years, the Commission has worked to create a single European market for telecoms and played an important role in ensuring the harmonization of regulation. We do not expect that pan-European role to need replicating 
by an equivalent UK body after Brexit. But there may be some exceptional circumstances where some oversight may be needed. For example, if our reforms to BT's network division Openreach do not produce the desired results in the coming years, we may wish to impose an exceptional remedy such as splitting the companies in their entirety. Today, that kind of measure would need commission approval. After Brexit, if we believe structural separation is the only option for BT and Openreach to deliver for investment and for consumers, that decision would be taken in the UK by a domestic competition body, not by the European Commission. All our decisions as a regulator rightly remain subject to appeal in the UK courts. Ofcom believes in expert scrutiny and in transparency and in the accountability of our decisions in a form that provides confidence to businesses and is timely and efficient for consumers. Decisions must also be taken about the laws that should apply in the UK after Brexit. This is an incredibly important process, one that will determine the future of our media and telecoms companies for years to come and their impact on people and businesses. Within Ofcom, we have been doing a lot of detailed and forensic work to analyze the laws that govern our sectors and have advised the UK government on how these can continue to work after we leave the EU with some technical tweaks. We expect, too, that the government will maintain the independence enshrined by EU law for communications regulators so that we can seek industry's views, take decisions, advise governments, all with complete impartiality. In the longer term, we have called for, uh, for what we're calling a triple test to be applied when deciding which EU laws should continue to apply in the UK. In each and every instance of a piece of media or telecoms uh, legislation, we have urged Parliament to consider three crucial questions. First, does it prioritise the interests of UK consumers, people and businesses? Second, does it promote investment and competition? And thirdly, and critically, does it support UK companies' ability to trade successfully in the EU and conversely, EU companies' ability to serve UK customers. That final test is crucial. It will only be passed if the UK and the EU continue to work closely together to ease the transition that our industries are facing in our new relationship with the EU. That way, we can continue to promote communication between our countries, providing certainty to our businesses and shared standards and protections for all our people. In conclusion, I, I wanted to conclude where I started, which is about collaboration and working together. Brexit does not change the UK's desire to engage globally on issues of communication that affect all of us. Whether it's common standards for internet television, protecting our networks from cyber attacks or tackling fake news. These are all questions that demand global solutions and global collaboration. In many areas such as antitrust, European bodies have led international thinking and the UK too has played its part. I can promise that Ofcom will continue to remain a constructive and engaged voice, sharing our expertise to meet these common European but global challenges too. We have achieved a great deal together from protecting children online to ensuring consumers' rights to an open internet. Looking ahead, we will face the fourth industrial revolution together, a fusion of the physical, the digital, the biological worlds that will change our economies beyond recognition. And we want the UK to lead that innovation as we establish new trading relationships with the rest of the world. I admit that uh, none of this is straightforward. The Brexit negotiations themselves are complex, but with the right approach, we can achieve clarity for our businesses and secure protection, 
choice and value for our customers. As our relationship evolves, it's more important that all of us work together for the good. Thank you very much indeed.